Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, I am operating here against several very considerable disadvantages. First of all, my distinguished opponent, who proposes to play the entire ring for you on the piano until you surrender. <laughs> <laughs> then my chair, who is, as you know, a card-carrying Wagnerian. But as honest uh, as the day is long. Honest as the day is long, very possibly, but I took a look at his party card, <laughs> and its number is almost as low as Michael Portillo's. <laughs> Um, against these two very considerable disadvantages, I also have your own inner feelings. As you entered these, these premises, this hall, the former Alberto Villar Hall, um, as, you, as you entered, you were asked which you preferred, Verdi or Wagner. And if you were sure that nobody was listening, you said Verdi. But if you wanted to impress your partner, you said Wagner, didn't you? I could see a lady in the fourth row, yes. Um, <laughs> You did, didn't you? Because you thought, that's going to make me look a better person. It's going to make me look more intelligent, more appreciative. I can do the big things, where, whereas Verdi has been the object of a vicious propaganda campaign and written off as just another Italian tunes, tunesmith, an organ grinder to, to, to Wagner's pantheon of sound. So we're operating against that prejudice as well. And indeed, Verdi himself was operating against that prejudice, even though he enjoyed success before Wagner in 1842 with Nabucco. He started earlier. He was the first to get going. Um, from the middle of his life, from the 1860s, we'll come to that in a, in, in a little while, he was forever being berated by his own Italians for not being more like Wagner. Wagner was the monkey on his back. So in a sense, some of the argument that I have to present tonight is the argument that Verdi himself was presenting against the Wagnerian tendency, against the Wagnerian superiority. So uh, these, these are quite considerable uh, opponents, ladies and gentlemen. I don't underestimate them. And, and uh, you know, if I will be happy to get away with a two to one majority tonight. <laughs> I think we need to define terms. What do we need, mean by Verdi versus Wagner? You can't actually say one's music is better than the other because they are so different in any way. You can't compare music at this level. You are, what are you comparing? You're comparing apples and peaches, aren't you? Um, uh, I mean, if one was going to be a little unkind to Wagner, you'd say it was Granny Smith's against some luscious Italian fruit. But no, <laughs> we, we won't be unkind. Let's not be unkind to Wagner. It's not that kind of event. We'll be very polite to him studiously polite. Um, what are the terms, then, by which we can judge these two great summiteers of their art? Because there is no greater figure in Italian opera than Giuseppe Verdi, and no greater figure in German opera than, than Richard Wagner. And what I would propose, I hope my uh, distinguished opponent will agree, is that we look at two criteria. One is how each of them changed the course of music, certainly of their own art form. And the other is how each of them changed the world. Let me perhaps begin with a little bit of biography, just to get us up and running. I don't, I don't suspect that you've all, you've all swallowed Grove before you came in. Both are born in 1813, Wagner in May, um, Verdi in October. Verdi, Wagner is a city boy, he's born in Leipzig. Verdi is born in a village, a, a practically scrubland, a really nondescript place called Le Roncole. And uh, he is born into a family that, as they say, has seen better times. And there's probably nothing worse than to be born into a family that feels itself on the slide. They once owned a lot of property, they, they now own very little. And they are practically living a peasant existence, dependent to, to, to some degree on charity for their survival. This is not a good uh, environment in which to grow up. But fortunately, it catches the eye of a man called Antonio Barezzi in the nearby town of Vosetto, and he, Barezzi, sees his talent and supports the boy and puts him through school and then puts him through conservatory, and then Verdi goes and marries Barezzi's daughter, Margarita, and uh, is looking forward to live happily ever after and to settle down and write operas. And he starts doing that without any impact at all. He's 26 practically a grandfather in Italian terms, before his first opera gets staged. Every major Italian composer has had an opera on stage at around 20 or 21. Verdi waits until 26 before he gets there, and it is, of course, a flop. So um, he decides to take the family to Milan, because that's clearly where opera is going to be, where, where his fortune is going to be made or broken. 
And three fateful things happen. First of all, his little boy, 17 months old, dies of a childhood illness. Uh, they come to Milan, and his daughter falls sick, and his wife pawns her few jewels to try and keep the family together. The daughter dies. Finally, the worst blow of all, his wife dies. He is in his late 20s now, and he's totally bereft, and he has two choices. He can go back to the village, or he can write Nabucco. Well, we know what he did. He wrote Nabucco. And the effect in 1842 of Nabucco is enormous. It, it resonates still to this day, because with Nabucco, with Vapensiero, he defines the Italian aspiration of nationhood, but not in a nationalist sense. The key thing to remember about Verdi is he is never a narrow nationalist. And the proof of it is the story that he takes for Nabucco, which is the story of the Hebrew slaves in Babylon. They've been expelled from their land. They are scorned. They are, in Handel's term, despised and rejected. And they are, they are the downtrodden equally of Europe. Uh, they are constantly railed against in, in, in church pulpits. The Jews are, are, the Jews are our misfortune. Verdi is the first European composer to make an opera of the fate of the Jews and to use that as a paradigm for the fate of all oppressed people in Europe and in the world. And this is what takes off in 1842. Only Handel, in the entire history of music, only Handel has presented Jews as heroes on the stage, and that is in oratorio. On the last occasion, it was Judas Maccabeus. It's exactly 100 years before that Handel wrote Judas Maccabeus. 100 years until Verdi comes along and says, the Jew is the oppressed in us all. What is he doing here in Valpensiero? What is he saying to us? He's saying, Italy and Italians have the right to self-determination. They have a right to stand up tall among the nations. They have a right to be like the English, to be like the French. The Germans didn't yet exist. Uh, to be free people in their own land, but not in any narrow sense. They need to respect other cultures. They need to recognize that the Hebrews, who are so scorned, also have a similar right, and that if Italy is ever to be a state which will earn world respect, it will be a state of tolerance. It will be a state of multiculturalism. Ladies and gentlemen, how modern, how 21st century is that? I might add, how stark is that in contrast to Richard Wagner, who at the time that Verdi is presenting Nabucco is starting to write his notorious tract on Jewishness in music, in which he proposes that minorities, and Jews in particular, are excluded from European culture, the first known case of cultural ethnic cleansing. Why Verdi? That's one very good reason. We look on at the developing, the unfolding career of this astonishing musician. 1842, we said Nabucco. After that, it's one or two operas every year. There are 40 altogether. Nobody remembers them all, except possibly the late Edward Downs. John Tom, you'll remember him. Um, the late Edward Downs, who tried valiantly to perform all 40 in this place. Let me give you some highlights. 1842, Nabucco. 1847, an absolute annos mirabilis. Macbeth, which Verdi considered his greatest to date. Masnadieri in November, Jerusalem. Three major operas in a year. And then we come to March 1951. And over the next three years, Rigoletto, Trovatore, Traviata. Unbelievable. The summits of Italian opera. Some of the most performed operas of this day. Stephen, you were saying, which is the most current? Well, Traviata was performed 553 times uh, since uh, 2008-9 season. Right. So up to this date. And, and uh, Trovatore and Rigoletto are but pretty, they're up there too in pretty the close. Yeah. They're pretty close. Writing in the 1850s, he is still speaking to the Vox Populi of the 2000 and teens. Impossible. Impossible to imagine 
the effect that these operas had on their audiences. Um, in one of the lesser known operas, there is a scene where the hero jumps off a balcony and people in the audience got so excited by this that two of them jumped off the balcony into the orchestra. Fortunately, no, no musicians were harmed in the making of this production, we're told. You can't be too sure about the reporting from Italy.